And want to give you a little update on Leslie. I don't know if she's watching right now or we'll watch this later, but hi, Leslie, we love you. So Leslie Skinner is one of our uh, leadership council members, has been in Los Robles, and is doing much better. So it has been a crazy ride. She uh, got transferred to uh, Los Robles' rehab facility, and so that's a good step towards going home. So let's thank the Lord for that. And uh, she has a wall in her room where she's putting all of the notes from all of you, and our kids last week wrote some amazing notes with Bible verses and stuff for her. If you didn't get a chance to do that, on the wood cabinet uh, in the lobby, I like to call it our cigar cabinet because it looks like that, uh, you can write uh, notes to Leslie right there, and those will uh, be given to her this week, okay? Uh, and then one other really cool update, I've been um, talking with Julie Lindsay this week, and we're going to start something new. Uh, we're going to start prayer on Sunday mornings before the service. And so if you want to show up at 9.30 out under the oak tree and just spend some time seeking the Lord together and preparing your hearts for what happens in here, come and join her and others and, uh, and if you need some prayer, that's a good place to also show up and get ready. Now, we got in, Stacy and I got inspired. We went and visited Brooklyn Tabernacle a number of years ago. Tuesday nights, they have a prayer meeting that is packed. I mean, thousands of people come out to pray. Here's the thing that impacted me. They show up an hour early to get ready for prayer. They pray before the prayer meeting. Like, that is beautiful. And it honors the Lord. Like, I, I feel like some of us, like, we show up on Sunday morning and we're like, you know, like barely making it in the door, you know, and grabbing a cup of coffee on our way in. And, right, we're going to get a little less out of our time with the Lord than if we actually were intentional. We're like, I want to be ready to meet with you, Lord. Help me to, you know, get all of what you have for me today and help me to be there for others. Amen? Amen? Okay. So that starts next week. Uh, last Sunday, I spoke about uh, physical health and how we can love God and love others with our bodies. Um, it stirred the pot. I have had a whole bunch of conversations this week about, yeah, but you didn't talk about this. Hey, what does it mean for someone who's uh, critically ill? What does it mean for someone who is, you know, extremely elderly? What does it mean for this? What does it mean for that? Which has been awesome. Some great conversations. So I wanted to share just a couple of thoughts with you, uh, clarifying thoughts from, from last week. Uh, one is this. We talked last week about taking care of the temple. For some of you, that means doing more push-ups. For some of you, you're like, I can't even do a push-up. Like, what, do, what does it mean for me? One concept that we talked about last week was be the best version of you in God's eyes. Who has he created you to be? What has he made you capable of? Do that. Don't try to be somebody else. Don't, don't try to model yourself after, you know, the people around you. And ask Jesus, what does it mean for me? Don't, don't take some guilt trip from the pastor. Spend some time with the Lord and say, how do I process this between you and me? Amen. Amen. Um, here's the other thing that, that I've been thinking about. How did we end up in a place where Christians don't care about their bodies? I think it's a bigger picture, and, and here, here's where it comes from. I think in the 60s and 70s, there was this big movement of Jesus is coming back, like the world's going to hell in a handbasket. I don't have to, I just got to wait, because he's just sucking me up to heaven, and this is over, right? So, so that affected how do we treat our bodies. It affected debt. It affected ecology. Like, I don't need to take care of the planet, because who cares, and now we're stuck here with debt and a planet and bodies that we haven't been taking care of. And we're like, shoot, Jesus, you're taking too long. But for 2,000 years, people have been saying, Jesus, you're taking too long. Right? Okay. So that's how we ended up here. Now we got to be responsible. Even if we have not been, we have to say, what do I do now? So um, the, the big idea also is this. If I'm not healthy, it... it keeps my eyes on me because I'm just trying to survive. I'm trying to like make it through the day. If I'm healthier, 
I'm able to keep more focus on the Lord, and I'm able to help others when they're in need, rather than just trying to survive all my doctor's visits. Yes? Now, I'm not saying that in a judgmental way. I'm saying that in a, uh, it's not, and, and we also talked last week about being around more on the planet so we can help more people join us in heaven. So there is a quantity of life question, but there's also a quality of life question. How do I want these years to go, and what can I do to invest in that, rather than going, you know, I should have done that. Amen? Okay. Did, hopefully that was helpful rather than hurtful. We're okay? Okay. We're still friends? Okay. Okay. And, um, okay, so today we're going we're gonna to mess with, the Lord's going to mess with us even more. Uh, so today we're going to talk about finances, possessions, money, something, these things don't mean anything to Americans, so it should be nice and easy and I won't get any hate mail this, this week at all. So today, here's our topic, loving God and others with our finances. Do you see any problems with that statement? I wish I had the Jeopardy music right now. What do you see? What's the problem? Yeah. Ah, he, do you see how smart that Scott was? It's not our finances. But it's interesting how even as Christians, you know, we're believers in Jesus, we could read this and go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless we look at it and we're like, wait a minute. Are the things really ours or not? So uh, we're going to go, in, we're going to dig in and get into a lot of scripture today. And that's a good thing. Uh, but some of us aren't used to, like, uh, eating that much meat, if I were to say it that way, okay? So I want to I wanna tell you this, A, um, try to keep up, because I'm going to keep moving, because this could be like three weeks worth of stuff. The Bible has more to say about money than heaven and hell combined. There's a lot in here, because it's part of us. It's part of our thinking. It's part of our worship. It's part of our experience, part of our stewardship and our effectiveness on earth. It's all tied together. So it's important. And here's the other thing. Um, if you want to go back and check on some of the stuff that we've talked about today, you can do it on the Bible app. So here is a way to do that. On the Bible app, if you look under events, which is under more, you can find Caneo Church and you can find our sermon notes. And so this lovely person right here posts them every week for you. So you can check it out. And if you want to look up some scriptures, if you're like, what was that thing, that, that quote again? You can find them there, and they disappear in a week, right? So they're... Oh, you can save them. Okay. So they are there this week, so you can go back and check it out. Okay, so the first idea is we are stewards of God's stuff. So sometimes we think it's the opposite. We're like, well, I have some stuff that God can use. Wouldn't he really like to use my stuff? And that, that is a flip-flop. That's, that's an, an, an ac, inaccuracy. I heard a joke uh, a number of years ago about a, a guy who said, I'm going to start tithing. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take all my income, I'm going to put it in cash, and I'm going to make a deal with the Lord. Like, okay, Lord, I'm going to throw it up in the air, grab whatever you need. <laughs> and the rest of it I know is for me. Okay, so here's proof that we are stewards and not owners of the stuff. Deuteronomy 8 says, You may say to yourself, this, this sounds so American to me, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me, like the self-made person, right? But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. So you might say, I'm just such a hard worker, and look what I have done. Your next door neighbor may not have had the same opportunities as you and might be seeing things very differently. And we got to go back to the Lord and say, thank you for giving me the strength to even show up for work this week. Matthew 25 is probably the key passage about stewardship. It's the parable of the what? The talents, okay, which was a, a measurement of gold. And so Matthew 25, starting in 14, a guy goes on a journey and the picture here is, we find out later, is God, is, is the master. And so he goes out and he entrusts his servants with a certain number of talents. 
So here's one that's got five, here's one that's got two, here's one that's got one. And he says, use it while I'm gone and I'll be back eventually. So the first guy invests it, doubles it, well done. The second guy invests it, doubles it, well done. The third guy takes his and hides it in the ground. So the master comes back and goes, really? Like, you didn't do what I asked you to do. You didn't multiply it. You didn't invest it. You hid it. You took the thing. The ta I think it's interesting. It became our English word talent, right? So he took what he'd been entrusted with and did not put it to work. And then look at this verse, this next thing. You wicked, lazy servant. And then the end of the, the passage says, throw him outside where there be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So this is a sin of omission, not a sin of commission. He didn't kill anybody. He didn't sleep around. He didn't do this or that or the other thing. What he did was he didn't do what he was given. He didn't invest what he had been given. He didn't, he didn't put it to work for the Lord. Scary. And, and that's, you know, some of those pa parables are there as warnings to us, not because God's mean, it's the opposite, because he's loving. And he says, be careful to use what I have done given you. Luke 16. Um, I, I love this. This verse is really interesting to me. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? What? I, th this just got under my skin this week. I'm like, wait. So we think that it's all about the worldly stuff, and God says, no, that's kind of practice. Like, that, that's, if, be faithful with that because that's easy. And then I'll give you the other stuff that's harder, meaning gifts to you, spiritual gifts, opportunities to influence people. Uh, the, the prayer of Jabez, increasing your tents. Like, there's more for you to do on earth if you're, uh, if you're uh, being responsible with the easy stuff, which is finances. That's pretty wild. Now, look at the verse 13. It says, no one can serve two masters. You can't serve God and money, right? And the Pharisees are sneering at Jesus because they loved money. And then look what he, what he says. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. So Jesus is saying, be careful, you guys. The things that you love are not the things that God loves. I think that has a lot to do with our culture. So um, I was thinking this week that being a Christian... Uh, our Christian life is a lot like having a company credit card. And what do I mean by that? So if you have a company credit card, the assumption is you're not spending stuff all on yourself, right? Because then there's going to be a day of reckoning where your boss goes, really, Chris? Like the trip to Hawaii, what did that have to do with your job? Like it doesn't make any sense, right? And, and so just like that, the company, in this case, is the kingdom. So if I have the, the, uh, the, the credit card, the Christian credit card, right, all the stuff God has entrusted me with, the company card, I'm supposed to use this for his kingdom, for the company, not just for me. And, and I found that a totally helpful idea, like, wait a minute, sometimes I see this as my credit card, and it's really not. So when you look in your wallet, just think about, is this mine? Is this his? It's a great conversation to, to start thinking through. I, I remember having a dream in college because somebody told me about the Amex black card that has like up to a $300,000 limit, right? And so um, I, was, I was like, I had this dream, like somebody, you know, I got this thing and I get to, I got a car and I got a boat and I got all this stuff. And then my dream turned to a nightmare because one of my friends said, you know, you have to pay that back at the end of the month. And so as I, literally, I woke up in a cold sweat, and I'm like, oh my gosh. Like, okay. <laughs> but I think it's a little picture of our lives. We're, we're here for a short amount of time, and, and there will be some kind of accountability about what did we do with the time? What do we do with the gifts? What do we do with the cash that God entrusted us with? So how do you know if you are loving God with stuff? I think the first step is recognizing where it came from. And, and who really owns it? And are we using the stuff that we have for his glory or not? For instance, the house that you live in, is it used for him at all? Yeah, well, our house is too nice. I can't really have people over. 
maybe you got the wrong house, right? Well, I, I can't lend any my, anybody my car because they're going to scratch it up. Uh, I remember going on a mission trip with a guy that had a guitar, and somebody asked to borrow it, and he's like, I don't let anybody use it. And I was like, dude, your guitar is going to get run over by a bus because it's God's. Like, be careful. So I have fishing gear, and, and sometimes I loan it to people because it's not mine. And so we have to be careful about, like, what, what do we do with the stuff that God's given us, and how do we use it for his glory? I'm not saying being dumb and, and irresponsible and letting people ruin all your stuff. But I am saying whose stuff is it, and how is it used for his glory, right? right? So James 1.17 says, every good and perfect gift is from where? Above. So how do you love others with the stuff God has entrusted you with? First is this, don't spend it all on you. Look for ways to help somebody else, which is a way of becoming like our Heavenly Father, because he is generous. So did you know the English word generous means of noble birth? So we become more like him when we take on that characteristic of generosity. And, and my goal is to become more like him over my lifetime rather than to become more like the people I see on Instagram who have all kinds of stuff. I want to be more like him than them. Because odds are, between posts, some of those people are pretty unhappy. Now, they look pretty smiley in that post when, you know, with the new roles that's matte black. But the next day, I, I'm, I'm thinking that I'm probably happier than they are because I have this perspective with the Lord that is doing pretty well right now. I'm growing to be more like my dad, right? right? So here's a deep thought. Generosity is something that God wants for you much more than from you. In other words, you will be happier if you are generous. You will be less happy if you are not. This is actually a true statement. It's not just a Christian statement. Other religions will say a similar thing because this is kind of a, a human being statement. Right and here, here's the other thing. God doesn't need anything from you, right? So if, if, if I'm thinking he requires me to be generous, that's kind of saying he needs me to do something for him. He doesn't, but he wants me to do things for him and others because it helps me too, and it helps others around me. Giving itself is a gift. Have you ever heard this, uh, this statement or this verse, it's better to give than to receive? So, fun fact, do you know why this is an important verse? This is a statement of Jesus that's not in the Gospels. It's recorded in the book of Acts. And so Paul, uh, I can't remember who is saying this. Yeah, Acts 20, this would be Paul. He is saying, remember when the Lord said this, when he was on earth. So I think that's an interesting thing that that verse is Jesus quoted, not in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, but picked up in the book of Acts. And generosity actually brings freedom. If you look at uh, Proverbs 11, one person gives freely yet gains more. Another withholds but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. I've got some friends that are super generous. They're fun to be around. And I don't even mean that they're giving me something. That's not it. They're, there's just an outlook. There's something in their eyes that's pretty cool to watch. Um, I feel like some people are rivers and others are lakes. So here, here's what I mean by that. Do resources th flow through you or do they stop at you, right? So I want to be a river where God entrusts me with stuff that's going to help somebody else rather than just, oh man, look how much stuff I have. Um, so how do we put money in its proper place? Uh, 1 Timothy 6 talks about the desire to be rich. And I think this is interesting. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into all kinds of foolish and harmful desires that bring ruin and destruction. And, and it doesn't say money is the root of evil. It says the love of money. So money is kind of a neutral thing. Possessions are a neutral thing. It's what do we do with them, right? And then it says some people eager for money 
have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with griefs. So people think this is going to make me happy. And they think that this pursuit is good, and it ends up piercing them. Greed can be a terrible master. And, uh, and think about this. If you look at the evils of the world, just about all of them can come back to greed. So if you think about uh, genocides and trafficking and slavery and organized crime and all kinds of stuff, greed is really the root for just about all of that. Matthew 6, don't store up for yourself treasures on earth, but store up for yourselves treasures where? In heaven. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So remember when I was talking about being around generous people and there's something about them, there's something that you like, something even in their eyes? Check this out. This is the words of Jesus. He said, for the eye is the lamp of the body, if your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your body will be full of darkness. The word here that's interesting in Greek means generous. If your eyes are generous, if your eyes are stingy. What? What a cool thing that he's getting after. Is, is there something in us and, and the way that we look at the world that matters? And somebody looks at the world with a generous eye. Somebody looks at the world with a stingy eye. And then he goes on, and this is the same idea that we see several times in Scripture. No one can serve two masters. You can't serve God and money. So evidently, there's this theme for human beings. We choose which one's going to be on the throne. And we may not know which one it is. We may think that we're doing it right, and it may not be. And so this is a good thing to just pull out, pull it out every couple times a year and go, am, am I doing this okay? So let's talk about tithing for a minute. Is tithing for today? Hotly contested, lots of articles on this. Uh, I want to I tell you where I have netted out on this as I've, as I've studied it and prayed and lived life. I believe that tithing is our starting place for today. I believe that the New Testament uh, fulfills and, and, uh, and completes the Old Testament. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more of why I think tithing is a good idea today. Now, what's interesting is in the New Testament, we don't have prescriptive, John and Annie, you must tithe. We don't have that. What we have in the New Testament is descriptive. Here's what John and Annie did with what was given them. So it's interesting that we have stories more than commands in the New Testament, but we can learn a ton from those stories. So here's, here's the first idea. Tithing is a way of honoring God. Proverbs 3, 9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled with overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. So rewind 1,500 years, so the, the children of Israel were an agrarian society, so they produced crops. They gave the first 10% to the Lord, trusting that he would meet all their needs after that. That was a big risk. That was kind of scary. But they did that knowing that he is in charge, and they're not. It's a way of saying, God, you're in charge. Second is this, tithing is a universal principle. So tithing started before the law. It started before Leviticus. So Abraham tithed and, and Jacob tithed. So, so that's kind of interesting that it happened even before the law uh, was given to Moses. Number three, um, Jesus confirmed tithing when he had a chance to say, oh, that's old school. And so Matthew 23, he said, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices but you've neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, forgiveness. And this is an interesting line. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. So he could have said, you don't need to worry about that. I just want you to worry about justice. But he didn't do that. So he kind of put a snooze button on that and said, Look, you know, we're going to carry that forward a little while. That's interesting. Uh, and then verse 24, pretty heavy. You blind guides. You strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. I, 
I love the humor uh, in, in the ministry of Jesus. You can see it here and there where he is telling them straight up and he's also doing it in a way that is memorable. Like they will never forget those, those statements laid down against them. Uh, the fourth idea is this. The New Testament shows that the early believers went way beyond a tithe. So sometimes in the American church, we say, I don't think I can give 10%. Like that, you know, is it net? Is it gross? Um, you know, I don't know. This just seems like an outdated concept, which I think is kind of the wrong question. The, the, right, the, the right question is, is all of what I have God's and how does he want me to use it? is the right starting place rather than should I give 6% or 10% or we have to start in a different place. So when we look in the book of Acts, it says there was not a single needy person among them. Did that just magically happen? No, it happened because people sacrificed for their friends. And they saw each other as family and they said, well, she's in need, so I better help. Rather than she's in need, that's her problem. Interesting. Interesting. And, that, and I'm not talking about enabling, because if you look in, in the book of Acts, you don't see a lot of enabling happening. In fact, if you look in the words of Paul, he's saying, if you don't work, you don't eat. And he's saying, hey, the widows who are creating trouble, kick them out. Don't feed them. Like, he's pretty straight, like, right? But he's also, we're going to take care of each other and expect things of each other. A little different than the American system. Amen? Okay. Anyway, I thought there'd be a quick amen there, and it didn't happen. So here's why there were no needy persons among them, because people sold houses and land. So they sold their vacation properties, literally, and they no longer needed the tax break from Rome, I guess, right? So they just, they said, here's what I need to live, and anything else can be used to help somebody else. And so they, they were all the time doing that. And they gave it to support the poor, the poor and the mission of the gospel moving forward. Here's the other thing that's interesting. In the book of Luke, Zacchaeus was so grateful he gave half of his possessions to the poor because salvation came and changed his mind, changed his life. A poor widow, it says she gave all she had in the temple. It was only two pennies, but that's all she had. She gave 100%. That's pretty wild. Uh, and if we look in Matthew... There's a lady who's forgiven who evidently is like a family heirloom, but she breaks the alabaster jar of perfume that's priceless, pours it all over Jesus' feet. And the disciples are like, what the? You can't do that. She was being extravagant in her love for the Lord and giving the the most precious thing she had rather than holding it back for some day. I think that's just fascinating, right? Right So... So what does this all mean? I believe that tithing is a good starting place for New Testament giving, first fruits, putting God first with our finances rather than a last, uh, the last thing that we do with our finances because it shows that we trust him. And the New Testament teaches that everything is his, not just 10%, the whole, the whole thing. And we have to start somewhere in our lives so that we can grow in financial maturity. And we, th- we talk a lot about financial security, which actually has nothing to do with how much you have. But financial maturity is something that I think is lacking in a lot of the American church. How do I grow in my understanding of what God's given me? Um, because giving and tithing is more about our hearts than our finances. It shows our love, it shows our priorities, and sometimes it shows our fear. It shows our lack of faith, our lack of love, and, and I don't think that that the idea is, and you may have, I grew up hearing some sermons where I felt like the pastor's finger was in my face, like you are going to be judged because you don't, you know, with a really deep voice. Um, but I feel like what, what's really happening is the Lord is saying, I want you to trust me. I want you to come to me with everything, and I'll show you how to use it. And I gave it to you for a reason. So let's, let's work together on how I want you to use that for my glory, the Lord speaking. Okay, so what if you have not been giving and you want to start and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't do that. Like there's no, do you know what kind of debts we have? Do you know what kind of responsibilities we have? Do you know, wow, right? I mean, how do you even get started? 
So God has some words in Malachi chapter 3 that continue to blow my mind. Um, and he says, I want you to test me in this. So here's, here's one thing. Don't test God unless he says, test me. Okay? So this is the only place I've seen in Scripture. Is this right? Where he says, test me, Michelle? I think it's the only time where he says, test me. And so he says, uh, Matthew 3, I'm sorry, Malachi 3, will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? And then God answers, in tithes and offerings. Incidentally, uh, the t- there, were, there were three different tithes that the Israelites had. And so it was not 10%. It ended up to be more than that. And then there were also offerings that helped the poor and helped during certain festivals and et cetera. So there, was, there wasn't just a 10% happening. There was a lot more happening in, in their lives. Uh, verse 10, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Test me in this. There's that line. Says the Lord Almighty, see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. So just just a little caveat there. Don't give so that God will give you millions. Give because God has invited you to be like him. Give because he puts needs in front of you that he wants you to be part of meeting, right? And he promises to meet our needs. Now, sometimes our wants get confused with our needs. And, and so I have seen sometimes people go through really hard times in their life where they're like, man, I did not have the finances that we needed during this time. But here's what's interesting. Sometimes during those seasons, they're growing in other ways, and God's giving them riches in here and in here and in their relationships that would not have happened if they had the cash. So God's meeting all of our needs according to his riches and glory. Sometimes we like how he's doing it. Sometimes we're not so sure. But there's a trust that has to be part of this whole equation. 2 Corinthians 9 says, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. But whoever sows generously will also reap generously. And look at this, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give not reluctantly or other compulsion, not a guilt trip. That's not what we're doing today. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all you need, a lot of alls, you will abound in every good work. Look at the end. God's goal is for your life to matter, for you to be helping other people, for you to walk into the works that he created from the beginning of time for you to walk into so that your life matters forever. And that doesn't mean that you're going to be Billy Graham. Odds are none of us will be Billy Graham, right? But we will be stepping into who God has created us to be, the opportunities he's given us to influence others. And that's more important than having money. I think it's interesting how it ends with you will abound in good work. It doesn't say you'll abound in, you know, a a huge retirement, but in good work. So what if you owned a field and you sowed sparingly? So I've got one of the fields down in Oxnard, let's say, is mine, and it's four acres, and it's gorgeous property in the floodplain, and I can grow anything I want. But I'm just going to plant one little corner of it, and I'm going to plant only 10% of my seeds. How's my harvest going to be? Now, doesn't that, it kind of makes me mad to think about it. I'm like, how could you do that? But I think that's kind of how we think sometimes. We're, we're cautious and careful and scared and fearful and anxious, and, and we just like, I'm, I'm just going to give a little bit and just see how that all works out. And that's a whole different picture than somebody going after the four acres and going, man, I got, I'm going to plant all my seed, and I'm going to pray that God blesses it, and we'll see what happens. I think that that harvest is going to be better, right? The person who sowed generously is going to have a whole bunch more plants than the person who planted one-tenth of their field with one-tenth of their seeds. It just makes logical sense. So, and what if you don't plant your seeds at all? That's the parable of the talent. So the guy's like, I got this bag of seeds. I'm going to put it in the safe. But that's how a lot of us think. I had to keep I'm going to keep the seeds for a rainy day. 
But the seeds are important. The seeds bring harvest. If they don't get planted, nothing can happen. Some people think that the Bible is really complicated. And, and then I read these things that are like, oh, so generously versus so sparingly. It kind of makes sense. I want my life to be out there invested in others. Okay. Um, so I want to ask the band to come on back up. And, uh, and I want to ask you just a couple of questions as, as we wrap it up. One is this. What are you investing in that will last forever? And it's probably not your business. It's probably not your dream home. But what are you investing in that will last forever and forever is a long time and is there anything because that's up to you that's not up to me that's you and the lord what are you going to invest in that will last forever i'm thinking about you michelle you she she does a radio show that is all over the middle east that is touching people who grew up muslim and teaching them about jesus pardon and in africa that will last forever so, I mean, if, if you invest $1,000 in what Michelle's doing, guess what? Some stuff will happen that will last forever. Right on. If you invest here at Caneo in what God's doing, lives will be touched forever. There, there are people that are starting to come to our church that have no church background or have given up on the Lord and said, that will never work for me, that will never be my house. And then I think, like, as for me and my house, that song we sang, they're switching. They're like, you know, yeah. As for me and my house, we're going to serve, that's forever. Like a life is changed. 1 Thessalonians 2.19, you ever think about reward in heaven and you're like, man, I can't wait to have that big mansion and, and all that gold. Gold is like bricks in heaven. It's kind of dumb to like want gold in heaven because it's so common. It's like, so what? But, but look at this. What is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of the Lord? Is it not you? So I believe that reward in heaven, there may be something to the, you know, some kind of something that we get. I think it's people. I think it's people that you have invested in directly or indirectly. I think it's people that are going to come up to you, Shannon, and go, thank you. And you're like, I don't even know who you are. And they're like, well, when you talk to so-and-so, who talked to so-and-so, who encouraged so-and-so, who prayed with so-and-so, they helped me get here. And you're like, wait, what? Right? Or when you gave that money to that missionary who helped that thing happen, when you supported your church to do this, crowns. Like stuff that lasts forever, way beyond us. So if you want to leave a legacy, it's people. It's not things. And, and I think you see that all over in Scripture. So giving is not really about a, a number. I, I don't want us to get stuck there. Um, it's not like 10% is his and 90% is yours. It's all his. So give to him whatever you decide in your heart, not out of obligation, because he doesn't want you to give something that you give grudgingly. The whole th Remember it said the Lord loves a cheerful giver? So... So don't give something that you don't want to give. Give what you do want to give. And say, Lord, what do you want me to give? And how does that look to you? And, and how is that faithful? And how is that growing my financial maturity? And pray and ask him for a next step. Here's the other thing. Sometimes, sometimes people are like, there's no way I could do 10% right now. So how many of you, if you have not gone to the gym in 10 years, would start at full capacity tomorrow? I think for a lot of people, taking a step is the right thing, right? right and, and take a wise step of faith and see what the Lord will do when you meet him there in the middle. Right um, so, so just this, this last thought. What is God calling you to do? And where is he inviting you to trust him with the resources he's given you? And how are you becoming more like him than the culture? So I, have, I just have a sense that some of us in this room or some of us watching online, we need to have less culture input. So if you are always looking at the house, the trip, 
the car, the et cetera, on Pinterest or on Instagram, or you just, you build this unrealistic and I think dangerous expectation of, I gotta have all that. And the Lord's like, no, I want you to spend time in my word and with me and with my people, and I want you to reach the planet. And you can't serve God and Instagram. You can't serve God and Pinterest. You can't serve God and money. So let's pray. Lord, I ask that you'd show each of us in this room what is our next step with the resources you've given us. We ask Jesus for the, the faith, the courage to take steps towards financial maturity. And Lord, I ask that everybody in this room would be amazed at how you use their lives for your glory. Lord, I ask that things that we've been stingy with would free up I ask, Lord, that you'd provide resources that we can use for your glory where we feel like we don't have the means. I ask, Lord, that you would help us to see the, the money, the retirement, the income, the tax return, the whatever. Help us to see all that from your perspective, not our own. And, Lord, I ask that your people would not be fearful, but we'd be faithful. Help us to be more like you because you are our generous dad. Thank you, Jesus, for showing your generosity in everything that you did for us and everything you continue to do for us. And thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're a generous giver of all good gifts. Thank you, Lord. Amen.